For decades, Cincinnati has had a lot going on above ground. But what makes this historic city unique is what's hidden below it. In the 1830s and 40s, hundreds of thousands of German refugees fled to the United States in hope of a life free from repression and inequality. In Cincinnati, they settled in the historic Over the Rhine district, and they brought with them their most treasured product, beer. The United States is often referred to as a nation of immigrants. Julie Carpenter is an architectural historian specializing in the region's rich history. By the time Over the Rhine was fully developed, the neighborhood was between 60 and 75 percent German. You see a lot of buildings that have German language on them. What we know as Republic Street today was originally called Bremen. Cincinnati already had an established brewing industry, but the newest residents added something distinctly German. For as long as there have been people in Cincinnati, people have been brewing beer. The earliest breweries were run by English, Irish, Scottish, and they were making traditional English-style beers, ales and porters. While the English breweries remained above ground, the German ones relied on subterranean chambers to craft their delicious concoctions. So we're walking into the fermentation level of the Jackson Brewery. Mike Morgan is Cincinnati's resident beer expert. This room looks huge and cavernous now, but it would have been packed with fermenting beer in the 1800s. Huge wooden vats going up and down both sides of it. The only real difference between a lager and an ale is that lager yeast requires cool temperatures to ferment, and ale yeast ferments at room temperature. At their peak, nearly 35 breweries were producing more than 30 million gallons of beer per year. As demand grew, local business owners had to dig additional tunnels and cellars to accommodate production. All these lagering cellars have two levels. And on the upper level, they would ferment the beer. And on the lower level, they would age it. Most of the beer was consumed locally. But soon, the German lager's popularity spread far beyond the city limits. It was sending a lot of what was made here down to New Orleans. So if you went to the French Quarter, good chance was it came from right here in these lagering cellars. Demand increased exponentially. Over the Rhine and the city of Cincinnati experienced an economic boom due to beer production. So much so, the city earned its nickname as the beer capital of the world. But building cellars large enough to house not just fermentation tanks, but also thousands of barrels of the finished product was no easy task in the 1850s. The enterprising brewers got creative. The magic of beer in Cincinnati is right down these steps. Steve Hampton works for an organization revitalizing the brewing district. So we're 30 feet underground in the Crown Brewery cellars. They use arch stone construction. They use stone floors. They were typically built by very specialized contractors, cellar diggers. It was very hard to do, uh, 30, 40 feet underground. We were in the middle of a dense urban neighborhood where there were people working and living and playing literally right next to you. What brewers soon realized was that their underground recipe for success had a lethal side effect. Fermentation produces significant amounts of carbon dioxide. Built up CO2 would not only make these tunnels off limits for people, it would also starve the fermenting process of oxygen and slow or even stop the production of beer. They built these series of ventilation shafts. They look like fireplaces, but they're actually ventilation shafts. They could actually use the natural stack effect and let the warm air out of this space and keep fresh air in here. Ventilation solved the carbon dioxide problem, but keeping the cellars cold enough for the lager fermentation process needed further innovation. Early on, they would use ice that they would harvest from the lakes and the rivers and the canals and literally cut that in blocks, pack it away with the barrels of beer down here. There's a lot of cons to ice. 
It's expensive, it's unpredictable, it also melts, and that creates all sorts of problems. So they started using artificial refrigeration as soon as that was possible. And when they did, uh, there would have been lines crisscrossing through here, and it was ammonia that was run through those lines. While the early brewers had addressed the temperature issue, they unknowingly introduced another complication. Ammonia remains a very effective coolant. We don't use it today because it will kill you. They would oftentimes have ammonia leaks from the cooling systems that would kill draft horses. It could even overcome the, uh, the workers down here. Coolant leaks were just one of the many dangers facing workers in Cincinnati's underground breweries. They were often at risk of being injured by rolling kegs or kegs falling down, like massive kegs of a couple hundred pounds each, breaking legs and ankles. Beer was part of your pay, and so often you were drinking while you were on the job, and so uh, drinking in old cellars weren't always the most conducive to safety, and so we had a lot of accidents that way. As the breweries continued to boom, they managed to adapt and prosper. However, by the turn of the century, a nationwide shift was about to cast a dark shadow over Cincinnati's beer-making industry. All of this industry and all of this culture, it really all starts to collapse all at once. In the 19th century, innovations in beer making required breweries to undergo major upgrades. Cincinnati was at the forefront of these changes. Pasteurization in 1864, that's a big deal. You don't have to consume it immediately without it spoiling. We then get into technology around steel. So we go from wooden vats to big metal tanks that are easier to clean and get the bacteria out of. And we also start to see revolutions in glass. And then in 1892, you know, we had the crown bottle cap. Despite these investments, society was changing and the industry was in for a rude awakening. The United States enters World War I in 1917. When that happens, all of that Germanness that made over the Rhine such a unique European feeling place, that all becomes bad. So that's really the first blow. Prohibition goes into effect nationally in 1920. And so all of this industry and all of this culture, it really all starts to collapse all at once. By 1918, Laws were passed forcing breweries to shut down. And for many years, things looked very bleak for the Over the Rhine district. Some breweries tried to survive by brewing illegally, but police raids squashed most efforts, and soon the Cincinnati breweries were seemingly forgotten. 